Thank you. This morning I'm going to introduce to you a new music group we have on campus. So they prepared a song. Oh, oh. Um, no, this is the um, study abroad chapel. We're going to talk to you a little bit about what we learned in study abroad. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, study abroad is something that is very hard to replicate on our York College campus. And um, what our students did um, this summer is we went to Vienna for two and a half weeks. We did group travel together um, where we went to Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland. Uh, that's Poland. <laughs> for a Germany and I'm forgetting one. Okay, and then after our group travel, then the students went on independent travel where they got to choose wherever they wanted to travel to and we met back in, in Vienna. So what happens in study abroad is while we're in Vienna, we have a couple classes and we go to many places in Vienna and during group travel, we go to many places that we learned about in our coursework that we did in the United States and in Vienna. Um, what I had them do is journal what they learned. Yes, we had course outcomes of what we wanted them to learn in their history class, what we wanted them to learn in their Bible class, but what we find in study abroad because of its unique experience, they learn so much more than what we write in our syllabus. So each person has um, is going to read something that they wrote in their blog or talk about one of their experiences. I didn't tell them what they should talk about or read about. It's what was impactful to them. Um, so it just really depends on the person. So we're going to start off this morning with Cole. So if you get, as we pass the mic, move to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the blog post I'm going to read is one. Um, that I wrote after our first a few weeks in Vienna before we went on a, on a group travel. And I just want to say, like, if any of you are thinking about going, I highly encourage you to go because, I mean, it's one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. So anyway, um, as I sit here and reflect on my time in Vienna from these last two weeks, I'm filled with nothing but gratefulness and pure joy. Without a doubt, study abroad has been one of my greatest and life-changing experiences that I've ever done. On this trip, I've learned a great deal about history, the Holocaust, and World War II, while also learning more about myself. In these last few weeks, I've grown spiritually, emotionally, socially, and have made memories and friendships that will never be forgotten. I loved the two classes that we had on this trip, and greatly enjoyed having Dr. Mountjoy, Dr. DeHart, and Dr. Garner as professors. In both of these courses, I had the opportunity to learn new things, along with growing in my faith as we had discussions about the Sermon on the Mount. In our history course, I was able to learn a great deal about what it was like in Europe during World War II and learned a lot about the Holocaust that I had never been taught before growing up. In the Bible course, I greatly enjoyed learning about the Beatitudes and what Bonhoeffer had to say regarding the teachings of Jesus. I now have a greater understanding of what it means to be a disciple and to be a living example of Christ and what God calls us to be. Aside from the classes and coursework, I absolutely loved getting to walk around all of the museums and walk aimlessly around the beautiful city of Vienna. It's one thing getting to learn about history in the classroom, but you develop a much greater appreciation for it when you actually see and experience it. Throughout these last few weeks, I was constantly blown away by all of the beautiful architecture and all of the history, history located in the city. From getting to walk by St. Stephen's Cathedral and getting to see the Hotel Imperial where Adolf Hitler gave speeches, I was constantly in pure shock and awe of what this city had to offer. Finally, the people on this trip are what made these two weeks in Vienna so memorable and special. In these last few weeks, I was able to take my friendships with Trevor, Shania, Cassidy, Kelly, and Bree and blossom them into lifelong memories and friendships that I will always remember and cherish. This great group that I got to travel, laugh, smile, experience, and maybe even cry with in Vienna these last few weeks has made this trip one that I will always cherish. I was able to share amazing memories with them, share my story, and be vulnerable with them while getting to see how amazing and Christ-like each one of them are. This great group of friends has had a large impact on my life in such a short period of time that I will always be thankful for. As we get ready to leave Vienna and begin our group travel to Budapest, Prague, 
Krakow, and Berlin, I am filled with gratefulness. I'm grateful that my parents allowed me to go on this trip and for everyone who made this amazing experience possible for me. I can't wait for what the final part of our trip has to offer. Thank you, Deanna. It's been real. around here and that I never got to experience at home. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, one of my blog posts that I wrote. Um, during our free days this past weekend, I encountered a situation that pushed me far outside of my comfort zone. Coming from a rural village of 650 people, I have very little experience with homeless people and beggars. So coming to a large city packed with such people was shocking. This weekend's event was more than just witnessing people performing or laying in the streets, however, and what followed was like, will likely be ingrained in my mind for a long time. After an encounter with a drunken man at a bratwurst stand, a few friends and I sat against the wall of St. Stephen's Cathedral, waiting for it to open for tourists so we could see the catacombs. It was Sunday, and a mass was being held until 1 o'clock that afternoon. We conversed casually, and, were ha and having finished our bratwursts, we were sharing some dark chocolate and watching the people of Vienna pass us by. One man, however, stopped right in front of us. He started at one end of the line made against the cathedral wall and held out his hands, asking for money. One by one he refused, and as he reached me, I shook my head in a similar fashion, saying, I'm sorry. But he didn't stop there. He held out his hands three more times, switching from bitte to please, once he heard that I spoke English. I stared at the one euro coin he was holding and lowered my head, gazing at my purse. I was lost in thought. What was I doing? Could I trust this man with my money? How did I know he wasn't going to use it for something like drugs or cigarettes? How did I know he was he was a beggar at all? Maybe he was just trying to scam a few euros off of unsuspecting tourists. A knot in my stomach urged me to make a decision. A voice in my head asked, what right have I to mistrust this man that I don't even know? He could be starving, and because of that, I need to take the chance and help him. I recalled a phrase we discussed in their Bible class this spring, give until it hurts. Yet something held me back. He was still standing in front of me, hands extended downwards to where I sat against the wall, so I raised my head to meet his gaze. Tell me your story, I implored. I have been in jail three times because of drugs. His response was immediate. Please, help me. I reconsidered him now that I had this information. Did he wish to change? How did I know him my money wouldn't be used to buy more drugs that could very well land him in jail for a fourth time? I wanted to help him, but I needed to make sure my money went towards a good cause. I asked him, are you hungry? He confirmed that he was. Would you like me to buy you some food? I was a bit hesitant to ask him this because I didn't know if taking him to a food vendor would be a good idea. But I figured if I bought him some food, maybe I could talk to him more and find some other way to help him. However, his, ne his next response was to shake his head. No, just money, he said, still pleading with me. I drew the line there. I'm sorry, I muttered, lowering my head again. He went away immediately. My friends may have applauded my effort, but after the encounter, a twinge of guilt made its home in my stomach. It was likely, sure, that the man only wanted money to use for drugs, but how many of the homeless beggars had the same intentions? Why was it that I only offered to help the ones who had asked it of me four times? Were not the people in rags laying on the streets just as worthy of my help and money? I don't have the answers. We are asked not to make a show of how gracious we are, yet the only opportunities I have to help these people are in the open streets. And there's no way I can help all of them, no way to know which ones actually need to be helped. I do know that the best way to help someone is to talk to them first. Maybe I would have been pressured into handing over a coin or two if I hadn't asked the man about his story. But then again, who am I to judge whether or not someone else need, deserves to be helped? I suppose if I can only help a few of these people, it must be the ones who need help the most. And the only way to know which ones need it the most is to talk to them. I suppose the moral of my story is this. Talk to those of need. If nothing else, you can give them a good conversation. So this is a blog post that I wrote towards the end of our time in Vienna. Um, it starts out like this. Since watching his documentary, I've been enthralled with Simon Wiesenthal. He stood for justice, for remembrance, and for love. As I shared in class, the concept of, forgi of forgiveness is something that I've always struggled with. I am my father's daughter in all aspects, and completely cutting people out of my life when they have hurt me is something that I've always done best, for lack of better terms. After being hurt a few times, I just found it easier to distance myself from all emotions mine and the other person's included. 
Not a healthy practice, I admit, but one that worked well for me for a very long time. But then we started to study the sunflower by Simon Wiesenthal, and my earth was kind of shattered. His motivation to expose the Nazis wasn't hatred, but to make a better tomorrow. He said, my cause was justice, not vengeance. My work is for a better tomorrow and a more secure future for our children and grandchildren. Just wow. I know personally I have acted out of hatred. I have said things about people and done things that did not reflect my heart, but more so my hurt. That was the opposite for Simon. After liberation, he chose to use his life as a way to better the people around him and to hold the people who caused so much hurt accountable. For that, I have more respect and admiration for him than anyone else. One of the greatest lessons I have learned lately is holding on to hatred will never serve you or your creator. And after all, that is our main goal on this earth, to serve the one who made the galaxies in each of us. Hatred holds no place in his heart, so it will not take any place in mine. If there's one thing that I can tell you guys, it's please just say yes. Say yes to this experience. You know, money might be an issue, but I guarantee you the money will find you. You won't have to search that hard for it. Um, you know, sometimes in our lives there's like those little things that we say, like the Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit. I'm pretty sure the Holy Spirit paid my first deposit because I probably blocked out when it happened. <laughs> but just like, please just say yes, because you'll be changed for the better forever. Hey guys, um, this blog post that I'm reading is um, one that I wrote after we visited Auschwitz. Um, June 3rd, 2018. Honestly, I don't know how to describe my Auschwitz experience. I've been thinking about it for days and days and my mind is almost blank. Before even going to this place, I had been trying to prepare myself because I knew that once I got there, I was going to lose it. And that I did. Being there made me feel uncomfortable. I was upset and nervous at the same time. The rooms, the buildings, and the watch towers were also real to me, as if we were going to relive it. The room with piles and piles of hair made me bawl. It reminded me that girls my age were once treated like absolute crap and had their beauty stripped from them. When I was crying, it made me think of a memory from back in middle school, which was when we watched Anne Frank movie in class, and at the end, me and my friends were crying. And I remember asking my teacher the question, why? Why would they do those things to her? Until this day, I still wanted to know. Being there in that room with all that hair made me question, why? I know they were Jews, I get that, but they were also people too, human beings with loving and beautiful hearts, whose population was close to being wiped out. My thoughts were everywhere, and my emotions were overfilling. Being there also made me think of my family, being in that situation, and what would I do if we were to be separated from them. I myself couldn't bear the pain as an individual, and yet these people had to do so for many years. These people went through a lot and were freaking strong, physically, mentally, and spiritually. After a long day when we were leaving, Dr. Dehart was telling us a story. It was about a mom and his son who had got transported to Auschwitz, and when she was in line, she knew she was being taken away, so she tried to save her son by pushing him out of line with her. But he kept coming back. After she told him to go stand in the other line, he was upset with her. He thought his own mother didn't want him, so out of anger he yelled, I hate you, I wish you were dead. Not real realizing when she was going, where she was going. Shortly after that, she died in the gas chamber. After hearing this story, it made me very sad. This boy didn't see the sacrifice his mother was making for him, and sometimes we are oblivious to what our own parents do for us. I thought about so many times I have told my mom those similar words. Through all the pain and trouble she brought me as a kid and teenager, I was always so ugly to her. This made the pain in my heart a lot more stronger because that boy wasn't lucky like me. He didn't get to apologize to his mom like I've had the opportunity to do. It made me realize how grateful I am. Overall, the whole experience was overwhelming, but it definitely opened my eyes. There's so much I need to say and so many thoughts that I really can't put into words. The part that made it even worse was seeing how sad everybody was in the pictures hung at Auschwitz and then going to the topography of terror in Berlin yesterday and seeing multiple pictures of guards and people being happy while celebrating with Hitler. And it was just so sickening. Like, how could you sit there and worship this low life dude? I don't get it. Like, I get it. He was a hero at one point, but he was wrong. So no, I don't get it. The people knew he was wrong for what he was doing and didn't do anything to stop it. The whole situation was messed up, and there is so much to be said and heard. Although it was hard to see, I'm glad I was able to go and experience this. This opportunity was worth the heartache. Um, one of the quotes that I have on my slides says, Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Meaning we should study history more often and take it into consideration. It is necessary that if we don't, to avoid repeating the past. 
This quote was hung in one of the rooms, and I think it was to help us remind us that the past and how awful things were back then, and that we should be more united now to prevent the past from reoccurring. After experiencing Auschwitz, I walked away with wanting to love more, letting others know how much they mean to me before one day I wake up and I don't have the chance. I also left with always thinking the worst of things because sometimes others have it a lot worse than I do. All the time we think, excuse me, all the time we think life is rough because we didn't get our way one day and things aren't going right the next. But when I look back on the day that I visited Auschwitz, I'm reminded that those people had it tough for many years and still made it out. So one bad day isn't going to kill me. The storm will pass. That being said, Auschwitz has made a special place in my heart and I'm very thankful for enc encountering that moment. Thank you. Our next person, I'm pretty sure Trevor did this in his car on the way to student teaching this morning, so here's Trevor. I'm Trevor Lanier, and uh, I went on study abroad this past summer, and it was the greatest time of my life. And I suggest that if you have the opportunity to do it, you do it. There's nothing like being submersed into another culture where you don't speak the language, where you got to find out things on your own, and it's great. And uh, the biggest thing I took away from the summer of study abroad is growth happens when you're uncomfortable. And being in another country, like I just mentioned, will make you very uncomfortable. And I feel like that's what God does when he puts us in challenging situations.